Good morning, Dallas. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Masti Time Radio on this beautiful morning of Saturday, the 14th of January. So welcome to the show guest of the week today. So we are all excited. I hope you had a very busy week and all ready and set to listen to this beautiful, wonderful show because I have a very exciting guest in our studio today that are going to be giving a lot of lot of information about your health as well as we are going to explore something very new and something very interesting as well as <clears throat> informative so ladies and gentlemen this is your host Anu from uh, Masti Tham Radio presenting guest of the week today so without further delay I want to introduce today's guest he is not just a physician he's also an active volunteer in our community giving all his time we all know how physicians are so really busy with not just wearing different hats like a family man as well as a volunteer and a physician so everyone needs and it's definitely expectations are very high but in that busy schedule he is taking his time off to come to our studio to share this information with us so I'm really grateful and I would like to introduce Dr. Arun Chandrakant and um, really really happy to have you <coughs> in the studio and uh, thank you so much for joining so uh, let me start with the introduction and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, we will take it because our listeners are excited to hear who you are and where you are from and what you do and a little bit of information about yourself yeah thank you uh, anu for uh, giving us the giving me the opportunity to to be on the radio um, I, uh, my name is Arun Chandrakantan. Uh, I, um, in, I'm in clinical practice here uh, with a, a group called Dallas Nephrology Associates. We're actually um, the second largest uh, kidney disease group in the United States. Uh, we have about 75 uh, nephrologists that practice both in the Dallas and the Fort Worth area. And we, we do all aspects of uh, kidney disease care. Uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, end-stage renal disease, hospital care, and actually transplantation, which is uh, my primary focus. Um, and um, I, I wanted to wish also all the listeners uh, happy Pongal Makara Sankranti that's uh, uh, upcoming this, uh, this weekend for many of the communities. Well, thank you. That's uh, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Aruna, where uh, are you originally from, uh, like coming from India? That Which place are you from? Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I'm uh, originally from Tamil Nadu. Um, I actually born in uh, Chennai uh, and uh, immigrated to the United States actually in the early 70s with my parents. That is, uh, you know, that explains like, you know, how uh, America is so diversified and it doesn't matter which part of the world that we come from and we definitely contribute towards the goodness of this community. So uh, about uh, let's go with the uh, like what made you choose this profession and specifically something related to nephrology, which is a kidney uh, related, if I'm right. Yes, uh, that's correct. Um, actually, originally, um, when I finished high school, um, I, I actually majored in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, and I, at the time, I had a strong interest in you know, scientific issues. Um, I spent a fair bit of time during college um, working and kind of exploring the field of engineering and computer science. And mm -hmm. as I, as I w journeyed further, I realized that I, I had interests other, in other places. Mm -hmm. So I started looking um, at the medical field because I had always been interested in um, trying to, to, to see how, how people could help other people. Um, started volunteering in emergency rooms, hospitals, and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, that led me to, to, to the present career. So you know, applied for medical school. Actually, I was based <laughs> in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I grew up uh, most, most of my life. And um, went to medical school there and, and subsequently um, in order to do nephrology, which is kidney disease, a subspecialization of internal medicine, mm -hmm. you have to actually have to do adult internal medicine. So mm -hmm. completed, you know, training in internal medicine uh, in Boston and then subsequently um, did kidney disease in the same institution after that. It's a very tedious and um, it too, in order to complete this one, you definitely have to have a passion for this profession. Otherwise, uh, you may complete this one, but will not definitely enjoy that. Um, and I am sure that you agree with that as well. So a quick, you know, just a deviation from what we're talking about. So would you recommend any student here like, you know, because every parent uh, have expectation that, you know, their kids want to, um, you know, they want them to be a physician, which is a really an honorable 
uh, you know the uh, profession which they want them to have it so what is your uh, suggestion on that like do should they go for it or should they just you know like at least respect their children's decision i think it's it is certainly uh, an honorable profession and um you know this is something that needs you know a good amount of introspection from the individual student uh, mm -hmm. as well as the family members to decide whether they want to continue it it's like you said it's a very rigorous pathway um, mm -hmm. from high school um, typically you're talking about at least about 11 to 12 years of additional training especially if you become a subspecialist maybe for some people actually mm -hmm. even more so you have to consider one thing is many times people who go into other fields mm -hmm. they already are finished within four to five years uh, right. you know maybe six years if they do a master's and so on mm -hmm. whereas you're all, all also continuing on education and you're living on you know uh, you know you know basically maintenance uh, type of salary and also taking out tremendous amounts of loans sure. one thing is the average medical student actually the loan in the United States can be about one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. Wow! Um, and you're paying that back uh, over time. And mm -hmm. the healthcare market is changing a lot. Sure. Um, and you know there there's a lot of talk from the old administration with the Affordable Care Act, as well mm -hmm. as the current administration coming in, just Trump. Mm -hmm. um, you know about all the changes that are going to be made in medicine, and those are actually affecting uh, physicians uh, in 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 a very big way. So mm -hmm. I think the person, my main point would be, whoever wants to do this, they should have interest. Mm -hmm. They should also know that there are going to be a lot of changes when they come out. You can't look at it in the current uh, right, scheme right. because you'll only be finishing in 10 or 12 years. Sure, sure. Yes, uh, thanks for all that uh, very, very important information for the future doctors. Uh, definitely that will serve them well. And uh, let's come to the talk about uh, just a little bit about your profession. A nephrologist it's a I'm very sure it's very challenging so I would like to hear a little bit about like you know what kind of challenges that, that you face in day-to-day uh, -day life yeah so uh, nephrology is is basically kidney disease so it involves the care of people that have kidney problems whether they are problems that are short term or whether they are, are long term mm -hmm. um, many many people are familiar with the idea of dialysis uh, which mm -hmm. is a, um, a replacement therapy when kidney function fails mm -hmm. but actually the nephrologist work involves a lot more than dialysis it mm -hmm. involves um, care of people that develop a kidney problem that many times actually gets better mm -hmm. um, also involves the care of people that have high blood pressure right. um, and and that's a big portion of, of the care of, that we we give mm -hmm. as well as also um, um, transplantation. The challenges I think in the current scheme are that we take care of patients that have a lot of medical problems and um, these problems include diabetes uh, and hypertension mainly mm -hmm. but of course there's a lot of other things and a lot of our patients actually have problems with heart disease uh, congestive heart failure also mm -hmm. um, and you know so we we deal with people that are quite sick so when you're a nephrologist you're used to taking care of people that have many times have six or seven medical problems and many times have to deal with them uh, you know almost as a primary care physician mm -hmm. um, which means that you take care of the whole patient and mm -hmm. you don't just take care of one issue right so for me the challenge actually is trying to take care of the whole patient when a lot of the disease a lot of the things that they have problems with are not only kidney disease mm -hmm. and they involve a lot of other uh, portions of, of medical conditions and so the main thing is you have to be skilled at taking care of the whole patient before even going to that uh, big issue of a kidney transplant or a, even a kidney diseases let's start with uh, you know like a newer generation i'm very sure at very engaged nowadays that they are facing this uh, uh, difficulty with the kidney stones so the kidney stones is a very normal issue that i keep hearing in among the younger generation what do you think uh, is going wrong like where are they making a mistake and how do they improve to avoid or avoid that situation it's a good question so kidney kidney stones are very common like you mentioned um there is a good proportion of the population that actually has one kidney stone and you know uh, mm -hmm. the issue will be if you continue to have recurrent kidney stones mm -hmm. but the risk factors for for kidney stones are going to be many mm -hmm. um one is fact that people don't drink as much fluid as they did before right and the other thing is they drink a lot of things that may in a sense uh, cause them to become dehydrated so for instance even tea and coffee <laughs> may fall into those categories right? right when you drink those you you have the you, you many times have to urinate right away because of the way these affect the kidney the the, the chemicals that are secreted and so on um, also um, because of alcohol use um, kidney stones can be a little bit more prevalent mm -hmm. um, and uh, dietary 
factors are there also. Um, mm -hmm. The most common causes of kidney stones are what they call calcium oxalate. Okay. Um, they make up about 85% of stones. And interestingly enough, the, the uh, calcium oxalate stone disease doesn't always completely correlate with just increased calcium consumption. In fact, a lot of the studies, the medical studies, don't necessarily make that correlation. So mm -hmm. um, it, 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 is a, it, it is a problem that requires um, more intensive study with, uh, with doing what we call a 24-hour urine collection, where we collect the urine to figure out what people are secreting in the urine mm -hmm. to see what the risk factors are for why they are developing the stones. Well, you know that when the doctor suggests that he so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what our uh, doctor suggests, we drink a lot of fluids, not just the fluids. Water is what he meant, <laughs> yeah. right? Because Correct. Correct. Uh, that is what uh, actually makes it easier to uh, clean up your urinary system and just, you know, makes it easier on you to get uh, this, you know, avoiding uh, the complications with any of the kidney uh, problems. So, coming about, uh, talking about, like, let's go back to the kidney transplant. Um, how common is it in, uh, you know, like, in what age group that are we talking about that it's normally is very uh, Okay, so, so kidney transplantation actually can be offered mm -hmm. um, in almost all age groups, including mm -hmm. very, very young children. Right. Um, uh, in the, in the pediatric group, I'm not a specialist in that area, but mm -hmm. just knowing from being in the field, you know, generally children have to have to grow to a certain size, mm -hmm. maybe 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 one and a half, two years, mm -hmm. basically because the abdomen has to be able to accommodate a, a transplant being placed in the abdomen because the kidney mm -hmm. is is a size, and and the, the, since babies are very small when they're born, mm -hmm. uh, the kidney would have to be placed there, and then. You know, it can go all the way to people. We transplant people sometimes even in their late 70s now. Um, with the technology that we have, with the mm -hmm. improvements in medical care, mm -hmm. with the understanding and experience that people have gained from, you know, worldwide with transplant, and this is prevalent worldwide, mm -hmm. um, but we, we are transplanting people uh, even into their late 70s. Mm -hmm. But the people that are in their late 70s, would have to be good candidates, meaning they can handle a big surgery. Uh, we don't expect that they are going to have major medical issues afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, they have to be very, you know, functionally active. Okay. Um, you know, exercising. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them play tennis. You know, they're 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 very, they're very select candidates. Mm -hmm. So I would say up to people in the in their late 60s. Uh, you know, people we we are quite aggressive at looking at people and trying to ascertain whether they can be candidates. As people get into their 70s, we we begin to look at them on a case by case basis mm -hmm. and try to ascertain whether or not those people really can withstand, withstand. this major surgery sure. and does it actually give them a benefit mm -hmm. you know the question is is that you know the ex life expectancy is somewhere in the late 70s to uh, around 80, 80. or so mm -hmm. and with kidney transplant you're actually you know pushing your life expectancy in a sense you're giving more quality of life mm -hmm. so the main thing is that you're giving better quality of life to people mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, that, that you would expect would actually benefit from it mm -hmm. you don't want to give it to somebody and then uh, if, if they are not going to be expected to live to that period of time. So it is true that with the uh, improved technology and also we, with the improved medication, so our baby bloomers are just, you know, increasing, you know, and also the, uh, you know, the uh, quality of life is also improving with all these uh, things. Uh, let's go back to the uh, basics of this one is, so how deeply it is the these diseases are connected to any other factors like for example the environmental factors or the stress level or the nutrition or any other things that really deeply matter to this uh, contribute towards this one yeah it's a good question so i don't think from from the kidney disease side we know that there are mm -hmm. certain diseases mm -hmm. um and they're not as prevalent in the u.s but but there are certain diseases that we know may come from some type of environmental toxins okay. um and and may be related to water supply and mm -hmm. sanitation and so mm -hmm. on. So there are so certain epidemics right now of kidney disease in Central America and in some parts of Asia. Mm -hmm. Even we think actually in India, maybe in Andhra Pradesh, there's a, there's a sector and so on, usually seen in laborers, mm -hmm. um, people that are out in the sun a lot. And the question is, is what are the environmental factors that are predisposing to that? Is it mm -hmm. periods of very significant dehydration? But as far as environmental factors, pro probably we don't have a clear understanding. Mm -hmm. But we do know that 
diabetes and hypertension okay. um, are a very big factor and they're a very big factor both in in the u.s population as well as in our south asian population mm -hmm. specifically and, and in indian in throughout the indian subcontinent okay. um, we also um, we, 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 we also know that these diseases um, contribute in a very big way to you know the kidney disease that we see right now so mm -hmm. 50 percent of people that um, go on to develop end-stage kidney disease just sure. uh, dialysis dependence um, 50 percent of them have diabetes uh, and hypertension hypertension. We also know that, you know, there may be other factors, you know, uh, weight. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, talking about obesity mm -hmm. uh, and sedentary uh, types of behavior, mm -hmm. that those things can uh, probably yeah. contribute, but those are probably all secondary factors. Right. Um, right. But, but so lifestyle probably plays a part, Very but trying different. to understand and tease it out mm -hmm. is not completely clear always. Okay. So that is a very uh, good point to note out because I know that with all the comfort levels that we are all uh, having at this, uh, uh, you know, the American dream living that we are living in, we just do not pay much of an attention in a day-to-day -day life and uh, sedentary <coughs> life like you mentioned that, you know, sitting on this chair. And I believe all the, um, you know, a so lot of uh, things are coming up like, for example, the Apple Watch or a Fitbit. So they even uh, warn you to get up and walk around for a few minutes, and I think that's a great uh, uh, asset that we can have, and if you follow those things, and then definitely to improve your lifestyle and avoid these kind of things. Uh, talking about the hypertension, so let's uh, see how this one is like directly or indirectly affect our health, or what exactly is uh, hypertension and um, you know, wh how we actually can avoid getting it or improve or prevent these things. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Musty Time Radio, and this is a guest of the week show that you're listening on this beautiful morning of Saturday. The time now is 8, 9.56, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 